saw the light understood. I wonder how many people do understand. I wonder how many people will go to Christmas services, Christmas Eve services, other celebrations like that, and totally miss, because they're busy with all of the activity of it, totally miss Christ. The light came into the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. How much time, when you're going through the Christmas season, do you give to Jesus? And how much time do you give to all the other preparations for parties, for meals, for presents, for wrappings, for eating, for opening and presents, and all the other things that go on? How much time do you give to Jesus? How much time do you give to all the rest of the stuff? Christ sometimes gets lost, literally gets ignored in the middle of Christmas. I still remember the lady who came to me on Christmas Sunday. We were planting a church, and we were in a high school, and Christmas was on Sunday. December 25 fell on a Sunday. And she walks in that morning. She's got two little girls, uh, I think a six-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. And she's just kind of in a huff. Oh, wow, Christmas morning, you know, too bad. And she says, I can't believe it. Why are we having worship on Christmas? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just let her, okay, just be a little bit upset there for a while. Let's, and this was as we were still, like I said, we're in high school, so there, we're setting up stuff, right, on Christmas Sunday, so we're out there and having to work and all before you can even worship in this messy cafeteria room. In the middle of worship, she literally stood up and she said, I am so sorry. This is what Christmas is about. I can't believe I was upset about us having worship on Christmas Sunday. It is a danger, folks, not just for the world, but for you and for me, for us to ignore Christ as we go through Christmas season. The verse, verse 9 says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Bruce Barton said, when, Whenever we see the lights of Christmas, let them remind us that they recall Christ, the true light. Do you put decorations up outside your house? Some of you? Why do you do that? So that people will think about Santa, right? Or because you want to increase your electric bill during this holiday season, right? <laughs> because we're trying to let the world know that there's something special that has happened during this season. The light of the world has come. Isaiah 42 says this. This is what the Lord, God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who, who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles." light for the Gentiles to, and listen why, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. That's why the light comes into the world. Isaiah 49, 6 says it this way, it is too small a thing to for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. 
He's speaking about the coming Messiah. It's not enough for the Messiah just to draw the tribes of Israel back to me. But he says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Do you remember Simeon? He's at the temple. And Jesus is being brought to the temple because it's a week, he's a week old, he's supposed to be circumcised and formally named, and you do that at the temple. Now there was a man, Luke 2.25, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Okay, folks, it's pretty cool. You're an old guy. You're at the temple. And you've been told you're not going to die before you see the Messiah. Now, this is even more cool because it's been 400 years since any prophet has spoken. There's been no message from God. And yet Simeon's just been told, Simeon, you're not going to die before you see the Messiah. Moved by that same spirit who had told him this, moved by that spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon walks up to him, like an old lady does, right? Excuse me, older grandmas. Excuse me, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Simeon! An old guy walks up, grabs the baby, and he starts praising God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Not while I'm holding the baby, though. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light to, of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. He's holding the Messiah, and the Spirit has revealed it to him. And he's saying, the light has come in the world. It's the light for the Gentiles, as well as a light for your people, Israel. That's interesting. Most people who were of Jewish descent didn't get that at that time, did they? They forgot that they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, and that would be the coming of the Messiah for that purpose. One theologian, Kenneth Gangle on True Light, said, we've created virtually every kind of artificial light possible for special effects on television and films. But nothing can compare with watching God's sunrise or sunset. I posted a picture of a sun, sunset the other night on Facebook. The camera didn't get it. I mean, it, it's a beautiful picture, right? But the camera didn't get it because the sky was actually brilliantly red along with all the color of that sunset that was going down. You see, no matter how much we try, we cannot match the true light of God that shines in the world. It's interesting. Jesus, in talking about himself, it says, it says that he was, it had been in Nazareth where he's being rejected, right? And he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the Sea of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Galilees, Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. What was he quoting from Isaiah 9, verse 2? The people who, in, who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Do you remember what Jesus said, John 8? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Or in John 12, 46, I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. The true light has come into the world and is shining brighter than any sunset or sunrise. It's unmatched. Think about what light means to us. Just, I'll give you several. Light's clean and pure, uh, just as Christ was good. 
Light penetrates, doesn't it? Just a little bit of light can penetrate the darkest of places. And it cuts through and eliminates darkness. So did Christ. Light enlightens us. It, it helps us to see and to understand. You know, we, we turn on a light so we can read, and so we can, can understand what's going on in front of us. So did Christ. Light reveals. It, it opens up truth of an area, a, a whole new world in life. It, it clears up the way. It, it shows us how to find life. That's light. John said, I, I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Light guides us, doesn't it? Have you ever walked around in the dark and stumbled and hurt yourself hitting something, you know, stubbing your toe, running into something because you can't see? But you turn the light on, and, and light guides you through that dark. It directs your path. So did Christ. Light strips away darkness and exposes things that you turn the light on, you can see what's on the floor and what may need to be cleaned up that you knocked over. Light routes the chaos. Light discriminates between the right way and the wrong way. Light warns. It, it tells us of danger that's coming. And, and, and light protects. It keeps us from following and injuring ourselves. And all, to all of these, so did Christ. So did Christ. The light, the true light, has come into the world. The light that gives light to everyone. Who can see the light? Anyone who wants to. Anyone who opens their eyes. It's interesting, the light here, it says, was coming into the world. It also is coming. It's, it's, it's one of these words, that it's, it's continuing in action. It doesn't stop. The public commentary says, the eternal, veritable light which does, by its universal shining, illumine every man is still coming. The cry, he is coming, was the language of the noblest of heathen philosophers philosophies. He is coming. It's the burden of the Old Testament. He's coming again. It's the great undersong of the church to the end of time. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Think about the beginning of Revelation chapter 1. It says, behold, he is coming. The light that has come into the world, the light that was coming, the light that is coming, that light is still coming back into the world. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, 7, or, or 1, 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come. And then the very last chapter, one of the last verses, Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. In verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. They had been in a time of darkness. No word of prophecy, no recognition of God. And what happens? The true light comes into the world and people, because they see Jesus, are able to see the light. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing Jesus? Wow. God's alive. Come in a human form. Imagine going there with those shepherds and seeing the baby and recognizing there's more to this baby than a little baby. Imagine going there to the temple when, when he's brought in to be named and, and, hold, and seeing Simeon holding him up. And This is the light of the world, folks. Imagine being there when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and, and you see this dove thing coming down and landing on him, and you hear John even saying, or oh, you actually hear better still this voice when there's no techno sound going on except for God saying, this is my beloved son. Imagine being there that day. Imagine seeing Jesus as he'd take a leper and touch him and saying, I want you to be clean. Imagine seeing Jesus as he 
It's a little girl and rises her from the dead. Uh, imagine Jesus as he's feeding the 5,000. Can you imagine being there and seeing Jesus? The true light that lights the world has come in and everyone can see it unless they don't want to. We move into some tough sections in this text this morning. The John, 10, John 1 10 says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John is saying, Look, the Word of God existed before creation, not just with some birth. God's always existed, which makes it clear that the Word was not created. What happened to Zechariah, do you remember? He's also in the temple for his time of responsibility. And while he's in there, an angel speaks to him. And, and Zechariah asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And then in verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin, Zechariah, Joseph, Mary, Elizabeth, they're all saying, how is this possible? We don't get it. We don't understand. But for each one of them, God will help them to see because God came to shine his light. The world didn't recognize him. The world didn't know him. The world didn't understand who he was. Frankly, the world did not want to see the light. James Boyce says the point of John's statement is that men and women are so in love with their sins that they do not want anyone to dissuade them from them. Stephen Cole asks, why didn't the world know its creator and savior? Well, one reason is that it's spiritually blind. Another reason is that they love their sin. And in many cases, the cause, cause is just indifference. People are immersed in their own things and don't have the time or desire to know Jesus in a personal saving way. I pray that's not us that we get so busy with what we're doing that we can't see Jesus, that we miss the opportunity to recognize what he's doing. Jerry Borcher, professor of mine, said, Western Christians generally have lived with the concept of knowing as primary, primarily related to the sphere of intellectual information. We're going to know it up here. But they need to recognize that such a definition is a far cry from the Johannine meaning of knowing Knowing is a relational idea in the gospel. Genesis 4.1 states that Adam, what? Knew his wife. It's that kind of knowledge that resulted in children. That knowledge obviously was not primarily intellectual. Accordingly, knowing the Logos in this gospel is more than knowing facts about the Logos. Religious people know facts about God. God's people know him. Colossians 1 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That same concept of God's been there since the beginning of time is repeated in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. What's Paul saying? Evidence of God is all around us. We choose whether we are going to acknowledge that evidence or not. The psalmist said it this way. 
the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Psalm 19. Our verse that we're about to look at is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Verse 11. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Hebrews says, We are a holy nation, a chosen priesthood. John is warning, he's saying, Look, the word of God, the light of God has come into the world, but his own, his own family, his own people, the people who should have known him, did not receive him. Do you remember what Jesus prayed as he's walking down towards Jerusalem? He's heading down there because he's going to die on a cross that next week. Well, there's crowds that are walking there with him and they're actually dropping palm branches and saying, Hosanna, meaning the Lord saves, and they don't even get what they're saying. And he stops and he looks out over Jerusalem and, and you can see at this place where Jesus stopped, he can see the whole temple grounds. He understands the place where God has met with his people. And he's looking there at the temple, at the main part of the city, coming from the eastern gate, which is where the Messiah is supposed to enter through. He's looking there and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent her to her. How often I wanted to gather you, your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Jesus has come to his family. It's what will happen when some people will have their Christmas gatherings this year. They'll come to a family gathering with that expectation and hope that it's going to be different than it has been in the past, that everyone's going to be loving and kind and tender-hearted and gracious with one another. And someone will make some comment because people are per imperfect people. Someone will say something that hurts. Somebody may even say something intentionally to cut in because they're still grieving and hurting from something else that's happened in the past. And pretty soon eruption breaks out, fighting and and the, the merriment that was supposed to be love moves into unkindness and people leave. And sometimes they decide not to talk again. And family members who, who we hoped would love us just rejected us. And if you understand that feeling, have you ever been in that kind of a moment? It's what I felt that day my, my mom literally kicked me out of the house. And, and I'd been talking to her and been trying to set up. Well, you remember what it was about? Some of you know. We'd been trying to set up having Christmas together as a family. I realized today it was a stupid thing to want. With our little son, Tim, four years old, I just thought, do we have to go to mom's house, dad's house, in-law's house, try to have our own time, and also do church stuff? You know, it's, this season gets so busy. Could we just all gather in one place? Debbie's parents, my divorced parents, the rest of the family. Could we, could we just come to one place this one day of the year? Well, fool that I was, because that created an uproar that eventually had my mom literally screaming and hollering and kicking me out of her house. He came to his own family, and they rejected him. I remember walking away that day and saying to mom, Mom, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving because you're telling me to. I'm not leaving because I want to reject you, but I'm leaving because you're kicking me out. You're telling me to leave. And then I remember driving down the road, and I'll never forget that little arm coming around my shoulder as I'm crying and trying to drive. And little Timmy is saying, I love you, Daddy. He came to his own. 
Jesus came to the people who knew him, who were expecting him. Folks, this is not just some, some, something that, uh, oh yeah, it's a story we've heard once in a while. Do you know that every single little girl prayed that she would be the mother of the Messiah? Every Jewish girl wanted that privilege. The children of Israel are in bondage in a sense. Rome has taken them over. They're not free to worship as they want. These people of all people should have recognized the coming of the Messiah because he's come to give them life and freedom. And they don't know him. His own did not receive him. But it's prophesied, wasn't it? Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? And we all say, oh, if I'd been there, I would have stopped it. I would have hollered. I would have said something about Jesus being crucified. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And, we, he will, uh, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. As Jesus was coming to the middle, hardest part of his ministry, Jesus said, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. And even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of the Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The light of the world has shined into darkness, but the world has not accepted him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. I want you to imagine yourself receiving just a really, really special gift. 
the advertisements on television now are having Mercedes as Christmas presents. Have, so, okay, you've got a Mercedes with a red bow that Santa materialized in your driveway. I think that's how the commercial says it. <laughs> so it, 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 it's sitting out there. The keys are ready for you. It's fully fueled. All you got to do is drive it away. But you choose not to accept it. You don't want the new car. Taxes, by the way, are paid for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay? But you don't want the new car because you like your old one. It breaks down and it's fun to have experiences with new strangers when it <laughs> breaks down. <laughs> so you stick with the old one and you ignore the new one. Is that what you would do with a gift like that? But here's what John is warning us about. The greatest gift in all of eternity has come into the world. And God's own people, God's own people, miss it. God's own people do not receive it. Paul said, I, I, Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christmas is more about the cross than it is about the manger. Christmas is about what God wants to do for our sins. Christmas is about what God wants to do to change our lives. Will we open the gift? Or will we ignore Jesus? And may I ask you, what's going to keep you personally from ignoring Christ this Christmas? What's going to keep you from missing out on the best, best Christmas gift ever? Well, do you remember Joseph's discussion with the angel? Chapter 1, verse 20 of Matthew, he says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. What did he consider? He considered divorcing Mary. Why? He heard she was pregnant. He knows he hasn't had a part of that, so he's moving on. Even though he loves her, he's going to do it in a quiet way, but he's heading out of town. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And verse 24 says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. On Christmas morning, children will leap out of bed and rush to the living room or wherever the Christmas tree is, right? Paper and ribbon will soon threaten to push everyone out of the room. But will we let it push the Son of God out too? I don't remember who said this, but I'm going to quote it anyways. In all the excitement of the holiday, let's draw attention to the Savior. Like John the Baptist, let's point others to the one who came into the world but was not recognized by it. May the greetings we speak, the cards we send, the presents we give be motivated by our love for Jesus. After all, he is the real reason for the season. So will you ignore Jesus this year? the first thing that Andrew did when he opened up his Christmas present? He ran to his brother Simon and told him, we've found the Messiah, the Christ. He shared his present, didn't he? Will you ignore Emmanuel? by not talking about him? When Jesus came into the world, he shines a light in us. When we receive that light, that light shines from us, true? So here's the question you should ask yourself. How far are you reflecting the light of Jesus Christ? How 
far is it going out from you? Shine, Christ shines in you. He wants to now shine from you. How far is it going out? John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Jesus is praying right before he goes to cross, and he says, Oh God, my Father, here's, here's what life is, that they know you, God, that they know me, that they know. Verse 7, he says, Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I got a feeling that most of you would say, yep, I believe too. Right? Uh, you, this would be a perfect moment for an amen. amen. Okay, good. <laughs> I believe the words. They, they received them. They believe them. They've accepted them. And they know that it's true. And then verse 23. I and them, you and me. Okay, folks, guess what? We don't have to go to the manger to see Jesus. Because where is he? In us. In us. In you. In me. I and them, you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How well are you reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in your world? He came to that which his own, was his own. But his own did not receive him. His own. His own. We rejected him. Let's pray. God. I've got a feeling that most of us are sitting here and saying, well, I haven't rejected Jesus. I believe in him. I love him. I, I committed my life to him. Um, I've opened up that gift. I'd, I'd take the keys to that car and I'd drive it and have fun with it. Uh, most of us are saying, we're, we're, we're right there with you, God. We, we know you live in us and, and we honor you and we serve you. But Jesus, show us how during this Christmas season that we may be, that we may be rejecting you. When we don't shine the light, when we don't let other people see you, when we don't tell them that, that Jesus is what's making a difference in our life. And maybe, Lord, maybe some of us haven't received you. We intellectually know things about you. We've maybe even been in church for a long time. But in our heart of hearts, have not welcomed you in have not embraced you, have not made that personal commitment. And I just invite you, if you're at that place today where you need to say, it's time for me to receive Jesus, to take him like I would uh, an incredible gift, and to start enjoying that gift. If you need to do that, then just raise your hand, just as a statement, I want to receive Jesus. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Oh, God wants you to shine a light brightly for him. <coughs> There's something you need to change so that during this Christmas season, people can see Jesus in you. If you need to change something, just tell that to Jesus. You, you raise your hand, too, to say, you know, I want to shine, shine that light brighter for Jesus. Oh God. They were religious people. 
They were intense on following you, committed their lifestyle to serving you, and yet they missed you. Don't let us miss you this Christmas season. Help us to shine a light so that other people can see who you are. Shine through us, Jesus.